something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it when it's all about How much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath Whoa, I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself is not what you have required, no. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gerald. <clears throat> God bless you. Take your Bible, if you will, and turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to continue our series we've been doing all summer long called You Had Me at Hello. What we've been doing is looking at the first few introductory verses of each of the letters of the Apostle Paul. So it's been like a spiritual road trip we've been on this summer. We started in Rome. We spent a couple of weeks in Corinth. We've been to Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, uh, Thessalonica. We spent a couple of weeks. And then um, last week, we began these last few books that are found in the New Testament, uh, three of which are called the pastoral epistles because they're unique. All the nine letters that we studied up until last week were written to churches or to groups of Christians scattered throughout the world. But First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon are unique because they were written to an individual. First and Second Timothy and Titus to pastors. Timothy was the pastor at Ephesus. Titus was the pastor in Crete. And then finally Philemon, and, uh, and he wrote that little one-chapter letter to Philemon 
that we're going to study at the, uh, the end of our series. But what we've really been doing, we're calling it You Had Me at Hello, because we're just looking at the first few verses, but we're using those introductory verses, verses as a way of kind of summarizing and giving us the big idea of what these letters are all about. So in 2 Timothy, we come to one of the, the most incredible passages of Scripture you'll ever read. In fact, 2 Timothy is my favorite book in the Bible. It's really Paul's last will and testament to Timothy, who he calls his true son in the faith. And it ha- it, 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 someone has said last words are lasting words. And what we're going to read today, I hope, will be lasting words for you. 2 Timothy chapter 1, and uh, let's begin reading in verse 1. He says, now Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. Now that phrase, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, is probably the most common way that Paul would introduce one of these letters. Probably half of his 13 letters in the New Testament or so begin with that phrase, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. But then the next phrase is what I want you to focus on for this morning. He says, I'm an apostle of Christ by the will of God. And then listen to what he says next. According or in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Now that is an amazing phrase. Why? Because where is Paul writing this letter from? He's not just writing it from house arrest like he did his first letter to Timothy. He's not writing it where he's saying, I hope to see you soon. I can't wait to be reunited with you once again. It wasn't some, uh, some white collar jail that he was in. This was a mammoth time prison, a dungeon in Rome, a little round circular room with only light coming through a hole in the ceiling. He was completely separated and alienated from all of his friends and from fellowship. And, and literally, Paul knew he was on death row. Now, here's what's interesting. He begins this letter by saying, hey, I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And he says, in keeping with the promise of what? The promise of life. Isn't it interesting? When he wrote Philippians, he was in a jail. He was in a situation of discouragement where people would have been given to despair. And what does he write? He writes in Philippians, the most encouraging book in the Bible that's all about joy. And now here he is on death row, and he's going to tell us about the promise of what? Life. Life. You know, Woody Allen famously said, I'm not afraid of dying. He said, it's not that I'm afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. You know, life and death, death is an issue that that so many times we avoid, we don't want to talk about. And yet Annie Lennox, the former lead singer of Eurythmics, the, the great singer Annie Lennox, she said this. She said, dying is easy. It's living that scares me to death. Isn't it interesting that Jesus of Nazareth said, I have come that you might have life. And you might have it to the full. Some translations say that you might have it abundantly or more abundantly. That Jesus wants to give you life. He wants you to have eternal life, but he also wants you to have an abundant life. In essence, what that verse really means is this. That the gospel means that you and I can not only live after we die... But are you ready? God wants you to really live before you die. And that in Christ and in the gospel, we live with the promise of life that is both now and forever. So what I want to share with you this morning is the life that Christ and that God has promised you. 
the life that God promises us. First of all, look at verses 3 through 5. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, look at verses 3 through 5 because we're going to find the first secret of this life that we can have through Christ. Look at what it says in verse 3. He says, I thank my God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Now remember, he's not writing this to the church at Ephesus where Timothy pastors. He's writing this to Timothy. And he's saying, hey, Timothy, I call your name every day in prayer. When I make up my list of all the things I'm thankful for, you are number one at the top of my list. He says, I constantly remember you. Now look at verse 4. He says, recalling your what? Your what? Your tears. Isn't that interesting? He says, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. He says, Timothy, I'm so thankful for you. I'm always praying for you. And he says, you know what I remember? He says, I remember your tears. And he said, recalling your tears, he said, I long to see you. I wish that I could jump out of this prison and I could, I could get on a chariot or a horse and I could come and find you and just embrace you and, and, and be with you. And he says, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. If you have something to write with, I'm going to give you three promises that God makes. He promises us life, first of all, through all our tears. Is that good news? Is that why the gospel is good news? That God promises you and me that we can experience life, abundant life, real life, not just existing, but really living even through all our tears. Can I tell you a little secret? <clears throat> There's no magic pill that you can take that will make you happy all the time. You know, Jesus said the rain falls on the just and the unjust. That means, you know what, if you do the right thing, sometimes it's still going to rain on your parade. In other words, whether you're doing the right thing or whether you're doing the wrong thing, into all our lives, some rain is going to fall. You are going to have tears. It's not a question of if you're going to suffer. It's just a question of when. We're all going to struggle. We're all going to go through life. And can I tell you, Jesus promised you can have life even through all your tears. Now, what was it that gave Paul the concept and the confidence of joy? What was it that encouraged him? What was it that refreshed him? What was it that renewed him even in the midst of his tears? It was the mere thought of his friendship and brotherhood and relationship with Timothy, right? In other words, if you've got one true friend, you've got more than your share, someone famously said. The value of a true friend. My father used to say, never underestimate the value of a lifelong friend. Why? Because it is the one thing you cannot replace. Where do you go to find a lifelong friend? It takes a lifetime, right? And so, so, so this friendship, this bond, this brotherhood that Paul and Timothy shared, friend, that's one of the things that got Paul through the tears. And he was saying to Timothy, and he was saying to you and me, that, that God promises us life even through our tears. And he says, listen, it's through relationships through genuine friendship. Turn in your Bible to 2 Timothy, probably just one page. 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verses 1 and 2. 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to tell you real simply how you can be a strong Christian. Are you interested? If you want to be a strong Christian, here's the secret. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. What does he say? You then, my son... Be strong, how? In the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 
So the secret to being strong is to be weak. The secret to a strong Christian's faith is that they're they're surrendered to Christ and they're relying on God's power. He says, be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then look at verse 2. Look at verse 2. And remember that verse 2 is in the context of verse 1. He's talking about how to be strong in the grace of God. And in verse 2, he says this, And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people, faithful men, who will also be qualified to teach others. Notice there are four generations of faith in that verse. One of the secrets of being strong in faith is passing the baton of faith on to the next generation. The things you have heard me say. So it goes from Paul to Timothy, and the baton is passed. He says, entrust these to reliable, faithful people. It goes from Paul to Timothy to reliable people so that they will be able to teach others. Do you see all four generations of faith? And what's the secret? It's passing the baton of faith. Go down to verse 22. 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. You get the same idea. That our strength is in numbers. Our strength is when we're together. Look at chapter 2, verse 22. Flee the evil desires of youth. And pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Now, we got some young people here today. I see Gerald's daughter's here. And my kids are here. And some of you just look young. And uh, uh, Hope is here, just graduated from high school. And uh, how about a big hand for Hope and Tyler and Desiree, all these kids that graduated this year. And uh, can I give you a little secret, all you young adults? If you want to stay out of trouble, let me give you a very practical principle. If you want to stay out of trouble, read 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Because it tells you how to stay away from the bad stuff and how to follow and chase after the good stuff. He says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Can you read the last part with me? Along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. When I was a young boy... After church on a Sunday, just like this service, we got out of church. You guys, anybody live in Fort Lauderdale long enough to remember Morrison's Cafeteria? Half the Sundays of the month, we'd pile in the car. We had one of those station wagons with the wood paneling on the sides. And we'd get in the old Buick station wagon and had the eight-track tape in there. Eight, eight track tape in there. We'd ride over to Cafeteria and we'd get out there and we'd eat all the food. This was where I first learned to eat fried shrimp. And I got a plate of shrimp, and I had half a dozen shrimp, and, and I ate all that food, and I ate everything up. And my father said, Stephen, what would you do with all your shrimp? And I said, I ate it. It was delicious. He said, well, where are the tails? I said, tails? What are the tails? <laughs> One Sunday after church, my Uncle Jack, uh, dear friends of my parents, lifelong friends, uh, invited me over to sit at a table away from the family. I didn't know if I was in trouble or what was going on. But he sat me down. He told me that his father made a deal with him when he was a young man. And he said, if you won't drink, smoke, or do drugs until you're 21, I'll give you a brand new car. His father owned a car dealership. The only problem was when Jack turned 21 and told his dad he had kept the promise, his dad said, Jack, I'm so sorry. I don't know how to tell you this. I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed. Times are tough. I can't afford to give you the car. I'm so sorry. And Jack said to me as a little boy, he said, Stephen, I realized that day my father had given me something more valuable than a brand new car. He had given me a reason to make good, wise choices. And he said, I never regretted it. And I always promised myself if I had a son... I would make the same kind of deal with him. He said, I can't buy you a brand new car, but I will give you a certified cashier's check for $1,000. If you will make a commitment to me right now, you will not drink, smoke, or do drugs until you're 21 years of age. My eyes got big as saucers, $1,000. He might as well have said $100 million to me. 
Now, can I tell you, I was a youth pastor in Texas for a few years, and, and I've talked to young people over the years, and when I tell this story, they're always amazed. Pastor Stephen, did you really not smoke, drink, or do drugs until you were 21? I said, oh, yeah, I didn't do any of those things until I got to seminary. No, no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. So, so, but I, I say, I would tell that story, and sometimes these kids would look at me, hope, Sometimes these kids would look at me, and you know the experience, they couldn't imagine how could you go through high school and college. By the way, when I was in college, you know, I didn't go to Bob Jones, or I didn't go to some religious convent. I went to Florida State University, and I lived in a dorm my freshman and sophomore year. Listen to this. It was co-ed. The dorm was co-ed. I mean, it was like party central. And, and when I tell that story, people always say to me, how in the world were you able to do it? And can I tell you, it was the easiest thing I ever did. I can honestly stand before you and say, there was never a moment from the time I was 12 until I was 21 that I actually thought, wow, this is hard. I have to say no to this temptation. When I tell that story, people look at me like I have four heads. They're like, what are you talking about? You see what that verse says? Flee the evil desires of youth. Pursue righteousness, peace, faith, love, etc. How? How do you live this life? Along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Hey, guys, I don't want to embarrass your, you know, our family. Sometimes I tell stories about our family, and it's a little too graphic. But can I just tell you, when your mother and I were dating, it wasn't real hard for me to not smoke pot with your mother. You know why? She didn't want to do that. It wasn't a real struggle. She never offered me a cigarette. See, what happened was all my friends... Christ followers, they were godly young people, they were trying. I didn't have friends that offered me marijuana. I didn't have any friends that did all these things. Why? Because we were all down at Bible study at church, and we were going to Campus Crusade in college, and we were doing all these things. Kelly and Joyce Sisk are sitting back there this morning, and I grew up with some of their kids, and when I was in seminary, my first semester, or second semester of seminary, I slept on the floor in your son's dorm room for a few weeks with an illegal puppy that I had at, uh, at Fort Worth Hall at Southwestern Seminary. And, uh, and you know, if you, if you were friends with Shane Sisk, you weren't going to get in too much trouble. Why? Because he wasn't going to those places, and he wasn't doing those things. What happens is, if you surround yourself with the right friends... It's one of the ways God gets you through the tears. It gets you through the struggles. It gets you through temptation. See, life is a relay race. The Bible says the things you've heard me say, I need you to pass those on. In 2008 at the Beijing Olympics, the United States men's and women's 400-meter relay teams both missed the finals for the gold medal. Favored, expected to win. It had been 50 years since the women's U.S. team hadn't made the finals. It had been 100 years since the men's team had not made the finals. Does anybody want to take a guess how both of these relay teams missed the finals with some of the fastest people in the world running on their team? In the, in the preliminary, they both dropped the baton. And they were in the lead when they dropped the baton. If you fail to pass your faith on to those that are coming behind you, what you're going to do is you're going to find up you're all alone. If you're not building relationships, if you're not a part of authentic fellowship, you're missing out on the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. He gives us life through all our tears. How? By, by putting real relationships in our life. We're going to talk in a couple weeks in Philemon about how we always say that Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. Have you heard that a million times? Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. But listen, what did Jesus say the greatest commandment was? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and what? And love your neighbor 
as yourself. Christianity is not a religion merely. It is a relationship with God. But can I tell you something else? Christianity is more than just a relationship with God. It's also a relationship with his family. And and one of the ways that we get through all the tears is because we have loving, healthy relationships, friendship. We have fellowship. Fellowship, it's, it's family that's not biological. Someone said that your family, or excuse me, your friends are the family that you choose. You're born with one family, but then you choose who your friends are. One of the most important decisions you will ever make in life is who you're going to share life with. And God promises us life through all our tears. And so what's the principle here? That life is a relay race. And it's not so much about what you're going to take with you, but it's what you leave behind that counts. The things you remember. Mike Ditka, the famous football coach, said, that it's not the Super Bowl that he thinks about. It's the guys in the locker room that he remembers. That's what stays with you. It's the relationships that you form. You know what Billy Graham said? One of his only regrets in life was, shortly before his death, Billy Graham was asked, what do you regret? Isn't this amazing? Dr. Graham said, I wish I had more friends who were younger than me. Can you relate to that? See, as you get older and you realize that you have more yesterdays than tomorrows, you start looking around and you realize that a lot of the people you love, they're already in heaven. And Billy Graham said, you know, I got to a point I lived so long that all my friends were dead. And what is it that gets you through life? What is it that helps you to get through the tears? It's those relationships that God uses to sustain you and to encourage you. And so in verses 3 through 5, God promises us life through all of our tears. But secondly, look at verses 6 and 7. We're going to have to pick up the pace here a little bit. You guys aren't listening fast enough. But look at verses 6 and 7. He says this, chapter 1. We're back in chapter 1. He says, for this reason... I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Verse 7, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. He says, God does not, it's not the spirit of, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of self-control. And so not only does Jesus promise you life, Life forever, life abundant right here and now. But he says, I'm going to give you life through all your tears. And then write this down, number two. God promises us life through all our fears. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Go to chapter 2, verse 3. He says, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Now, can you imagine the context? Here's Paul, the apostle, uh, sitting in a, on a, in a death row mamertime dungeon in Rome. He's writing a letter to Timothy, and he says, hey, Timothy, here's my brochure about Christianity. Chapter 2, verse 3, here's what he says. Does this sound like a vacation opportunity? Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Does that sell? Come on down here and get in this little cell with me. Join with me in suffering. What is he promising? He's promising Timothy it's going to be hard. He's promising Timothy it's not going to be a free ride. Look at what he says in chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. Skip over to 2 Timothy 3. Look at verse 10. You, however... You know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance. Look at verse 11. 
persecutions, sufferings. What kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Look at chapter 3, verse 12. In fact, everyone, say everyone. Everyone who wants to live a godly, what? Life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Have you ever heard people say that the the best things in life are free? Let me tell you about the best things in life. The best things in life are very expensive. They're hard. Anything that's worth doing, anything that's worth having, it doesn't come easily. And so what do we have to do? If we're going to experience real life, we need to meet Christ through all of our tears. We need to meet Christ through all our fears, through the struggles, through the difficulty. In chapter 4, verse 2, he goes on and he says this, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, preach the word, be ready, be prepared, when? In season and out of season. Amen? Amen? Hey, listen, you're going to have some times in your marriage that are in season. And you're going to have some times when it's out of season. If you're raising kids or if you're dealing and trying to communicate with parents, can I get an amen? There's in season and there's out of season. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it can get ugly. Sometimes it's hard. Life is hard. And, and, And he says, listen, you can have life through all your fears. Why? Because he is with us and he will never leave us. We said life was a relay race, but can I give you another thought, another quote? Life is not just a relay race. Life is an obstacle course and it is filled with hurdles that must be overcome. That's what life's all about. And and if you read 2 Timothy, it's basically a laundry list of hurdles that have to be overcome. There's fear, there's shame, there's suffering, there's persecution, there's uh, error, there's opposition. In the last times, it'll be terrible. In the last days, there'll be terrible times. You're going to be swimming upstream. You're going to be pumping water uphill. You're going to be going against the current of the culture. He says life is an obstacle course. It's filled with hurdles. But what's the secret? The secret is you just have to trust him one day at a time. And the way to be strong is in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Remember in Corinthians when we studied that verse that says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. God can give you life through all your fears. You know, there was a a young woman who grew up in Casablanca, literally, She grew up in in Morocco in Casablanca, and boy, she could run like the wind. The problem was she was a Muslim girl in a Muslim land. And uh, Muslim women didn't compete in the Olympics. They they didn't get a lot of support and training. But this young lady, her name was Nawal El Mutawakala. I I can't pronounce her last name, but, but this young girl named Nawal, boy, she could really run, and she got some support And she made it all the way to the Olympics. And listen to this. She was not just the first Moroccan woman to win Olympic gold. Nawal was the first Muslim woman of any country to win a gold medal. She came back to Morocco, a national hero, and she became involved in trying to help young girls get opportunities. And there's a famous race In Casablanca, there's a 10K that 30,000 people a year participate in that she started. And she's a minister of recreation for the country. And and, uh, and God has used her to kind of open up the nation in many ways. But listen to this. She said, running the 400-meter hurdles is a metaphor for my life. She said, my whole life has been about overcoming hurdles. The hurdle of being a woman in a Muslim country. The hurdle of competing without all the 
training and expertise that the rest of the nations have. And what is the principle here that God is promising? He says, God's not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Life is an obstacle course, but friends, those hurdles can be overcome. First John says, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So let's take a quiz here, just a quick little questionnaire. How many of you have a problem today? Could I see your hands? Anybody? Or is it just me? Right? Those of you that are watching online, you, you think about what's your biggest problem? What's your biggest hurdle that you've got to overcome right now? Think about it for a moment and then remember this. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Your biggest problem is your greatest opportunity to experience God's grace. And the fact is, sometimes hot water keeps us pure. Sometimes God will put a mountain in your path just to remind you that you need to lean on him. Christ promises us life through all of our tears, through all of our fears. And then thirdly, look at what he says in verses 8 through 12. Go down to verse 8. Paul, writing to Timothy, says, So, don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord of me as prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Paul saying to Timothy, this story, this gospel story, it's bigger than you and me. He says in, um, uh, in verse 10, now it has been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus. He's destroyed death and he's brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus Christ on the cross defeated sin and death itself. He has defeated death, and he's brought to light life and immortality through the gospel. And listen to what he says in verse 11. Of this gospel, I was appointed a herald. Look at that word, herald. That's very important. What is a herald? Someone who is sent with a message, a runner. Think of Paul Revere's Midnight Run. The British are coming, the British are coming, and he's riding through all these little towns in New England, and he's warning them and telling them to get ready. He says, I'm a herald and an apostle, and a teacher, and then circle verse 12, and this is a verse of scripture you ought to memorize. You ought to, you ought to keep this verse in your mind, in your heart. 2 Timothy 1 verse 12, that is why I am suffering. These motivational speakers and self-help gurus today are trying to tell everybody what you need is a why. Have you ever heard that before? You got to have a Why? In other words, why are you doing it? That's where motivation comes from. And, and a lot of them will say, what is your why? The Apostle Paul is going to tell you his why. That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame. Because, because I know whom I have believed. And am convinced that he is able to Guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded and convinced that he is able to keep and guard that which I have entrusted, committed to him against that day. If you have something to write with, just jot this down, three words. Knowing, trusting, and living. Knowing, trusting, and living. Look at verse 12. He says, I'm suffering, but not for shame, because I know whom I have believed. Where does it begin? Where does faith begin? It begins with knowledge. I know whom I have believed. Paul knows who God is. That's where faith begins. It begins by knowing. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing the word of Christ. 
And so if we're going to grow our faith, we got to grow in knowledge. He knows the Lord. But then he says this, it's not just what I know and what I believe. I know whom I have believed. He says, and I am convinced. One translation says, I am persuaded. He has this deep conviction. A belief is something you hold, but a conviction is something that holds you. He's gone from knowing to trusting. And then he says this. What am I convinced of? That he is able. We know who God is, but we trust what God can do. We trust not just his person, but his power, that what he can do. He says, what is he able to do? To, that he's able to guard what I have entrusted. Notice that active verb. I've entrusted. I'm, I, I put my faith in him. I'm living in him. I, I know who he is. I know what he can do, and I'm acting in obedience on what I believe he will do. Knowing, trusting, and living by faith. That is the promise of life that's in Christ Jesus. We have a life through all our tears. We have life through all our fears. And number three, write this down. God will give you life through all your years. Through all your years. Someone has said, it is not the years in your life that count. It is the life in your life. Years. Friends, life is a relay race. That's how you get through the tears. Life is, a, is an obstacle course, and you can overcome all your fears. But, but mark this, life is a marathon, and God will get you to the finish line through all your years. It's a marathon. Christianity is not a 100-yard dash. Marriage, parenting, your career, your life, it's not a sprint. It is a long-distance race. You know, when they had the, uh, the first modern Olympic Games, they were in Athens, 1896, the first modern Olympics. And a French historian was looking for a way to tap into Greek history and come up with some way to make it compelling and interesting. And he remembered from tradition and history, there's this incredible story of the heralds, the couriers from, from ancient Greece that would literally run from town to town. They were runners. You know the phrase runner comes from this idea, the herald. That, that these guys, if there was a battle brewing, uh, you know, they, they would send somebody to run. And there, there's a famous, the, the way we got marathons was the first one was run in 1896. And it was based on this tradition, this history of this, this man who actually ran <clears throat> from Marathon to Athens. And if you ever wondered why they came up with 26.2 miles, is it's just a little bit over 25 miles. And with their crude arithmetic and measurements back then, they thought it was 26.2 miles from Marathon to Athens. And this, this young man, he ran all the way um, to tell them that they had won a great victory over the Persians. And he ran into town and he yelled, victory, he yelled, we won. We won. It's a pretty good picture of the Apostle Paul's life and ministry, isn't it? It's a pretty good picture of what it means to be an ambassador for Christ. That we are sent with a message and we're, we're sharing this message. You know that the Greeks wanted to win that first marathon in 1896 so bad. They were the only country that really trained for it. <clears throat> if you can imagine, the other nations had never done it before. They didn't really know that much about it. The men and women who ran in 1896 had never run 26.2 miles before at one time. Half of them quit and gave up halfway through. The Greeks had 17 different runners that had been training for that race. And a former soldier turned farmer, a young kind of commoner uh, named Lewis, ended up winning that race. In fact, he was so far ahead that uh, he stopped for a glass of wine and rested for a little while in the middle of the race. And he still won by seven minutes. 
when he came into the stadium and they were cheering, the prince and the crown prince of Greece came out of the stands and they wanted to run with him on the final lap. And to this day, there's a phrase in Greece related to his name that if you, when you're talking to somebody, if you're trying to tell them to speed it up, they'll say, again, Louis. And what it, what it means is, you know, run faster, run faster. And it comes from his name, Spiridon Lewis. And, 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 and that's part of Greek history. Can I tell you? Turn to chapter 4, and we're done. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I want to read you a final verse. I told you that Paul was on death row. Here's his last words. Chapter 4, verse 6. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. Verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Everybody listening? Perk up your ears. And not only to me, but also to who? To all who have longed for his appearing. Paul says, I'm writing to you from death row, but I'm writing about the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. You can have life through all your years. You can have life through all your fears, life through all your tears. He says, life is a relay race. It's not what you leave behind, not what you take with you, but what you leave behind. Life's an obstacle course. It's filled with hurdles, but they can be overcome by God's grace and through his power. And life is is a marathon. Don't give up. Paul said to the Galatians, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. What does that mean? It means don't quit. Don't quit on God. Don't quit on life. Why? Because he will never quit on you. What did Jesus say in John 14, verse 6? I'm the way. I'm the truth. And I'm the life. Can I tell you? Jesus is not just the way to life. He said, I am the way and I am the truth. But Jesus said, I am. Am the life. In John chapter 1, verse 4, what does it say? In him was life, and that life was the light of all men. Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, you know what it says? When Christ, who is our life. So if you're here this morning and you're not a believer, you say, tell me the principles that I need to understand so that I can understand the life that Christ will give me. Listen to me. Don't misunderstand. He, he offers us principles to live by. But if you want life, the life is in knowing him. The promise of life in Christ Jesus is that you can have Christ through all your tears. That you can have Jesus and the Spirit of God living in you to overcome all your fears. And through all your years, you will have him. Helen Keller said, I'd rather walk with a friend in the dark than to walk alone in the light. I want to ask you this morning, are you walking alone or are you walking with Christ? Let's bow our heads and pray. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed all over this room. Those of you that are watching on the internet, this is a sacred moment.
It's an opportunity for you to say yes to Jesus Christ. What does he offer you? Grace, mercy, peace, forgiveness, hope, meaning, purpose. Ultimately, he offers us life, life eternal. Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sin. He rose from the dead. He has the power to make you a brand new person, give you a brand new life. If you'll come to Christ today, if you'll say yes to Jesus Christ, make him the Lord of your life, trust him with all your heart, I can promise you, you'll live after you die. But can I tell you, it's even better than that. As miraculous and incredible as that is, It's not just that you can live after you die, but he wants you to really live before you die. He wants you to live in him. So if you're a believer here today, just spend this moment in silent prayer and just commit your life to Christ, recommit your heart to him. Can you say, I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Just renew your vows this morning. Thank God for Jesus, that he's the Lord of your heart and commit your life to him. If you've never trusted Christ as your savior, I wanna tell you today, it's as simple as just saying yes. He offers you the gift of eternal life. And all you have to say is, yes, Lord, come into my heart, yes, come into my life. Yes, I believe you love me. Yes, I believe you died on the cross. Yes, I admit my sin. And I ask you to come into my heart. Make me the person you want me to be. Would you make that your prayer today and just say, Lord, the best I know how, I put my life in your hands. Father, seal these words in our hearts. For Christ's sake, in Jesus' name, amen. Worship God with us this morning. Hallelujah. Anybody know that you're a friend of God this morning? No matter what we do, God is still our friend. He still keeps us. He still shows us grace and mercy. Amen. It's a real simple song that says this. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me? Come on. When I call. That's it. Come on, join with us. Is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing. Come on, say, who am I? Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? Say, is it true? Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me, how you love me. It's amazing. 
That's it. It's real easy singing with us, God Almighty. God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. Say God Almighty, say. Gerald and Christina and PJ, thank you so much for leading us today. Give them a big hand. Appreciate that. We appreciate all of you for being with us both here uh, on campus as well as all of you that are watching online right now. Thanks for being a part of our worship today here at Grace Point. Grace Point's not like a family. We are a family, and we want to connect with you. So if you have a prayer request you have a need, something you want to share with us, maybe you're watching online and you prayed with me today to receive Christ as your Savior, uh, you can send, me, send us an email. Just write pray at gracepoint.net. Share your prayer request. Share a decision for Christ. Some way we can come alongside and partner with you. Also, if you're looking to get connected, we have discipleship groups. We have grace groups. We have small groups, ways for you to plug in and build some of those healthy relationships that we talked about today. So if you want to get plugged in, send us an email. Just write belong 
at gracepoint.net and we'll connect with you and we'll get you to be part of our summer Bible reading program and we'll let you know how you can partner up with one of our small groups. We have a men's group, a women's group that both meet either over the phone or on Zoom weekly. We also have our one-on-one discipleship groups that are meeting uh, throughout the the week at different times. So if you want to get plugged in, let us know. Pray at gracepoint.net. Belong at gracepoint.net. Shoot us an email and connect with us. Now, for those of you online, if you want to give and support the ministry of Grace Point Church, if you want to help change the world one life at a time, you can just go to gracepoint.net, click on the word giving in the upper right-hand corner, and it's real simple. It takes about one minute, and you can be a part of, of, uh, of supporting and helping with tithes and offerings. If you're here today and you want to give physically, there are offering boxes in the back wall, and you can drop... Uh, your offering in the back as well. But we encourage folks, give online. It's quick and easy, and we don't have to count it. So it makes it easy and simple with all these precautions we're trying to take. But you're welcome to give in the offering boxes as well as online. Got a couple things we want to share with our church family today. Lauren Gursky, he's looking mighty patriotic there, swallowed up with the American flag above and below. And uh, Lauren is going to be moving. We're not sure if it's this week or next week, but I didn't want to miss uh, his last Sunday here. So you may see him again, depending on scheduling, but he's going to be moving over to the West Coast. And uh, Lauren, we just love you. We appreciate you. We're going to be praying. God's going to help you find a great church over there. And uh, we look forward to you being back and connecting with us uh, through all the years and through all the tears. And uh, it's bittersweet because we're sorry to see you go, but we're excited about God's blessing and what he's doing in your life. Also, we're going to have a bittersweet time next Saturday. Pastor Paul, it's the 22nd, and is at 2 p.m. We're going to have a celebration, a memorial for Roland LaCire. Roland LaCire went to heaven, and uh, we're going to get together as as a family and celebrate it. And so I know you've been praying for Dorothy and Ron and Aaron, all the family. And uh, we're going we're gonna to come together next Saturday at 2 p.m. And it is going to be live here in the building. And we'll have social distancing, wear your mask and all that. But it's going to be a great time. Dorothy wanted you to know how much she treasures your prayers and your encouragement. But uh, we know you can't lose somebody if you know where they are. And so we celebrate that Roland is with the Lord um, today. Listen, God bless you for being here, being a part of our worship And uh, I just want to pray for you today. We're going to close with a word of prayer. And uh, let's thank God that he'll be with us to the end. Amen. Father, we love you. We just praise you and thank you. Thank you that you give us the strength to live. That, Lord, you give us the grace, the mercy, the peace to face every situation that's before us. Lord, in the midst of this great pandemic, Lord, we thank you that you are in control, that we don't have to fear the future because while we don't know what the future holds, we know who holds the future. So we just put our lives in your hands and we thank you that we're safe and secure in the palm of your hand. Lord, we pray for folks in our church that are hurting and and, uh, and Lord, especially the Lakires and for Dorothy. God, would you just give the, the strength and the hope that only you can. Be the God of all comfort to them. And, uh, and we pray for Lauren, Lord, as he goes out, that you would give him grace and strength to face the days that are before him as well. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for all that you are and all that you do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, Wednesday night at 7 p.m., join us online. Go to our YouTube channel. We're not here in the building, but we're online Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. We're going to do a deep dive into 2 Timothy, and I'm going to tell you about the five different kinds of people you're going to meet in life from the end of chapter 4. And uh, so I want you to join me Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Next Sunday morning, we'll be back here at 10 a.m., both on campus and online. We hope you'll be a part of it. God bless you for being here. Pardon me? And school is starting this week. Let's pray over the schools. Bonnie, why don't you come up here and pray for me, will you? Pray for all these students. Be careful what you tell me. If you remind me of something, you might have to come up on the platform. How about a big hand for the lovely Bonnie Geiger? Let's pray for all these schools and students. Here, she can use this. Got it? Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time.
Heavenly Father, thank you so much that these kids get to go back to school this week. And Lord, whatever that looks like, we're thankful, Lord, that, that they have this opportunity, that this virus has not taken you by surprise. It doesn't change your purpose or plan for any of us. But most of all, for these students who walk, Father, from so many different uh, walks in life, places, and, and homes. God, we pray a hedge of protection about those who walk on a campus. This week and this for this year, they're excited, Lord, each one, and we pray a hedge of protection about them from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Thank you for the teachers, Lord, these uh, frontline teachers who uh, are walking into a classroom excited, excited, Father, because we get to do what you've called us to do. So we ask for protection for all the teachers as well, for wisdom for those making decisions um, about at the education system in this country. And we thank you for it, Father. We walk in faith, not in fear, and thankful, Father, that what we have entrusted to you, you keep safe. Thank you for that promise. In Jesus' name, amen.